Welcome to the At The Coalface podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. This podcast is all about what it's really like in the trenches of digital and e-commerce. Businesses oftentimes have this feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out, right? They want to run the latest thing. They want to run the latest tech. They want to have the latest processes. They want to be in the latest fancy channels. Those are the types of things I'm facing, which is I try to tell my clients have one foot in the present, but also one foot in the future. And it's that one foot in the present piece that sometimes is missing. Jason Greenwood, it is good to have you here on Ecomotics. How are you doing? What's new with you? Oh, mate, it's fantastic to be here. I thank you for, for having me on. Look, it's been a it's been a crazy time. We're we're back in in red, as they call it here in New Zealand, which means we're uh, we're pretty clamped down on things, such as the story of COVID. That you we go through these waves, and New Zealand and Australia seem to be uh, taking a, a much more hardline approach than many other places in the world. So, yeah, we're, I'm lucky in that I, I live in an off grid tiny house. And I work remote with all of my clients anyway, so it's not it doesn't affect me as much as it does other people that are trying to get into offices and various other things. But but yeah, we're in the middle of summer here and the weather's beautiful and we're just trying to enjoy it as much as best we can. I have to wonder about being off grid. And this is going to be a pretty bougie question such as it is, but just the internet access and all of that. Because when I hear off grid, I think of chopping down trees to, to make fires and, and, and hunting and, and foraging for... So what is the actual like lifestyle of off grid and how are you still able to stay connected? I'm over here in Toronto, Canada, and your connection is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. It's a hundred percent wireless connection through through Vodafone. We have a rural wireless uh, broadband company here uh, called Farmside, uh, but they use the Vodafone five G four G and five G network, and they have a, they have a wireless a rural broadband connection. So basically, a hundred percent. As long as I've got power, then I can connect to the internet. And then obviously I can also tether with my cell phone. If that goes down, then I've always got a backup with tethering with my cell phone, which is uh, 4G out here. Although the, the standard 4G connectivity out here is pretty pathetic. So yeah, there's alternatives and it keeps us going. But yeah, living off grid is always exciting. We're on full solar, but we've got a, you know, I've got a 4 kVA generator as a backup. And yeah, we run off lithium, lithium batteries and yeah, we're pretty well set up. I'm wondering if this will end up being a, a thread throughout the remainder of the episode. No promises. I'm not saying it, it will or won't. But having looked into what you're up to and a lot of your future facing uh, discussion that you have with other people, it's it, it, it is interesting to me to, to see this really this not delicate, but intricate balance of both getting an abundance of nature. And, and breathing in the fresh air while at the same time really making use of tech at its best and that and at the forefront of it. So seeing that balance is something that uh, I, I find admirable. So we'll see how well we can integrate it to the remainder. My of the dog world. definitely has an opinion on that. He forces me. He's he's only about three years old and he's a mixed breed, but he's basically a Jack Russell mixed with a beagle. And so he's he definitely is very energetic. And so at least twice a day, he'll force me to get out and go for a walk on our on the property here. It's about 15 acres, semi-rural. And so he forces me to get out and go for a walk twice a day. I, I, whilst I spend a lot of time online, I also am been very grounded. And I, I try to make sure that I get out and actually breathe fresh air as often as I can and get sunshine on my face. The therapeutic qualities of it were lost on me for a long time. And I can tell if I don't leave my apartment for, for a few days at a time, the lethargy starts to set in, the ennui starts to set in. So yeah. All right. So here we go for our opening question that is you know, more on subject. Although I will say I, I love the whole what's new thing. I am keeping that. So anyways, tell us, what do you do? What are you up to these days? I've got a lot on my plate, but it's an exciting time to be in digital, as you can imagine. The COVID put a rocket under digital, unlike anything I've ever seen before. I've been in this industry for over 20 years, and, and I've just never seen anything like it. The demand went through the roof for digital, and, and it transformed the way we interact as humans. It transformed retail. It's you know, It's got long tail effects, but for me, my I started my consulting business, my independent consulting business smack in the middle of COVID. So I've been running that just over a year now. And it's been a fantastic run. Uh, I don't deal primarily with vanilla retailers. I deal with really complex commerce environments, B2B, D2C environments, really complex omni-channel environments, hybrid models, cross-border commerce, omni-channel integration, full stack commerce. So I don't just work on the e-commerce side. I work across the whole entire commerce stack, ERP, CRM, PIM, C CDP, warehouse management, order management, the whole stack really. And so I, I found that B2B primarily, especially during COVID, B2B historically has not necessarily had a big emphasis on e-com. 
And during COVID, they had to. They had no choice because a lot of their field sales reps and their account managers, et cetera, they couldn't go and see their, their customers. And so they had no choice but to adopt digital ways of working and they had no choice but to adopt digital commerce. And then they started to realize, geez, this is actually pretty bloody hard because we've got mm -hmm. price lists, we've got customer groups, we've got a quote process that has to be digitalized. We've got all these manual sort of organic processes that have grown over, say, 10, 20, 30 years of running a B2B business. And now we have to try to digitalize all these processes while at the same time, not alienating our sales teams and our account management teams who feel threatened by e-commerce in many instances. So how do we walk that fine line with digital enablement without threatening sales teams and who are the, the lifeblood of a lot of B2B businesses? They rely on B2B sales uh, teams to be able to close deals and be able to have that working relationship with the, with the customer. So it has been a massive transformation during this time, no doubt about it. And then Obviously, in 2021, the latest buzz is Web3, and what does that look like? And people asking me about that on a regular basis, and me trying to wind their expectations back and say, look, this is still very early days of Web3. You need to get your foundations right. Don't snap at the latest shiny thing. We need to get the basis, the, the absolute fundamental foundations of your business nailed, your operational core. We need to get that really efficient. We need to get that digitally enabled and we get, need to get that super efficient so that when you onboard these new channels, whether that be a marketplace channel, whether that be a social channel, whether that be a metaverse channel, it doesn't really matter what the channel is. You have to be able to onboard new channels as they emerge quickly, easily, and efficiently. And if you can't do that, then that signals a wider problem in your business that we probably need to address first. And that's the things that I've seen is that businesses oftentimes have this feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out, right? They want to run the latest thing. They want to run the latest tech. They want to have the latest processes. They want to be in the latest fancy channels that, you know, and in many cases, they don't even have an owned channel right yet with a great experience. And so those are the types of things I'm facing, which is I try to tell my clients have one foot in the present, but also one foot in the future. And it's that one foot in the present piece that sometimes is missing. When you say owned channel, what, I, to be fair, I, to be honest, I haven't heard that term yet. And I think what that means is a, whether that is a social media platform or um, a marketplace a platform, whatever, it is something that they have a strong foothold in and it's something that they're able to build out of. Is that, is that close enough? No, I, I would consider those leased or rented channels or, or in the case okay. of marketing, a earned channel. So when I say owned, I'm talking about an own website. So their own commerce channels that they own outright, manage, maintain, have control over. And then obviously an owned marketing channel might be an own podcast. Some of the other marketing channels, their, their own blog, their own channels that they can go direct to market through, whether that be from a marketing perspective or a transactional perspective. And then they have these rented or leased channels, which are the other transactional channels like marketplaces and social and other marketing channels that they effectively are, are pay to play in those. Yeah, yeah. so some more a, sh a shared channel environment. I guess the reason why I thought owned was more like a company or a brand has enough dominance in that channel that they are not only at the top of their game, but are actually having influence on other people. So then you get into this whole uh, ecosystem of which brands are um, set at the pace on these different platforms. But I, I understand what you're saying now, where versus like this podcast over here, created by the company, for the company. It's something that we have you know, full control over. Okay, so you brought up Web3. And my expectations for Web3 right now are like they don't exist just because I don't, I haven't really been able to wrap my head around it. So far, what I've come to understand, uh, at least as a part of Web3, we're talking about NFT, cryptocurrency, and you mentioned the metaverse. Now, does the metaverse qualify for Web3 or is the metaverse like its own lateral thing being built up because it's using the web as a resource, but it's really turning into its own world, Frank? Yeah, typically the metaverse is falls under that Web3 umbrella because it's enabled by certain digital technology that is only really starting to mature now. Obviously, VR, AR, XR, so mixed reality, those have been around for about a decade now in one form or another. But really, they're only starting to hit the mainstream dialogue outside of gaming and outside of commercial and military use. They're really only starting to, to move into the mainstream culture now. And NFTs have had a lot to do with that. Easy access to cryptocurrency has with the likes of Coinbase and Binance and the ease of, of getting into cryptocurrency now. And I think many of the major digital commerce influencers, such as Gary Vee and some of the other major players, even Tom Bilyeu and some of the other major players, going hammer and tongs at pushing not only the NFTs, but smart contracts and the influences that all of 
emerging and maturing technology will have on commerce and on relationships and on community. I think because there's some big names behind this and hundreds of billions worth of VC dollars flowing into this space, it's gone from vaporware to on the horizon. It, it, even a year ago, it was mostly just complete vaporware. But when you have Microsoft announcing in the last week that they're going to spend $69 billion to acquire Activision Blizzard, when you have Walmart in the last week announcing they're going to go all in on the metaverse and they're going to create their own cryptocurrency, when you have Google saying that they're going to go all in on the metaverse, they see the future there, they're creating a metaverse team within their business to go along with their other VR teams, which have been around since the Google Glasshole days. And so I think there's a lot of technology that is is becoming more mainstream because it's more accessible. And I recently had Mike Angel on my podcast episode has yet to come out yet, but he's one of the co-founders of Fractal, which is a gaming NFT marketplace. So when we look at those marketplaces emerging along with OpenSea and along with the new blockchains that are coming out that support really complex smart contracts, the, te the technology is maturing very fast. And whenever you have major investors, major retailers, basically all of the tech community focused on Web3 and underlying technologies. It, it, it may not be on the horizon tomorrow, but if people don't start learning about it today, they'll find their business being left behind. And I work with clients every day that lament or regret the fact that they didn't get into e-commerce sooner. They regret they didn't get into mobile sooner. They regret they didn't get into, you know, that they didn't get into social sooner or marketplaces sooner. And so am I saying that, for example, with my clients, am I telling them, hey, we need to look at this metaverse thing today. No, I'm not. But I'm saying, hey, look, you need to make sure that you keep your, your finger on the pulse of what's happening in this space, because it will become mainstream probably sometime in the next five to 10 years. And you need to be setting the foundation right now so that when that does hit the mainstream, you're ready to rock. This is a question that I was uh, chambering more towards the end, uh, just because it's a little bit more fun, but I can't resist the urge to ask you right away. But when you're paying, when you're keeping your eye on um, this emergent technology and when we talk about the metaverse, it can not only is it world changing, it's world creating. Uh, does any of this frighten you like in a dystopian sense or in a, a ready player one sense where people are going to start being drawn away from actual reality and live their life in there? I'm asking for fun, but I, I really am curious to, to know what's been your take on that from that point of view. Look, I, th I think that's an absolute risk. And I think there are dark sides to this that we could go down a long rabbit hole of Matrix-like outcomes. And effectively, if you want to see what the metaverse is all about, just go and rewatch the Matrix and you'll start to understand that is, for all intents and purposes, that is what the metaverse will be. It will mm -hmm. be... It will rapidly become virtual environments that are so lifelike and so realistic that you will not be able to distinguish them between the physical real world or base reality and virtual reality. But obviously, in virtual reality, there are other capabilities and functions and experiences we can have in those worlds that there is no analog for in the physical world. There is no equivalent. So we'll be able to have experiences in the virtual world that there is no physical current human equivalent for. And so that's going to be, you can almost think like the holodeck. You can think of it through many different lenses and many dystopian lenses. But I think that the technology is coming, whether we like it or not. And from my perspective, what I want to do is I want to have a positive dialogue and a positive contribution to where this goes mm -hmm. and encourage people to try to be able to find a better balance in their life now. Obviously, social media has shown us that we're really bad at balance, and many other things in the digital space have shown us we're really bad at balance, and I'm hoping that the metaverse doesn't turn out to be an equally unbalanced type of environment that kids go, kids disappear into because, for example, they're getting bullied at school, and they actually don't even want to go to school anymore, so they're going to go to school in the metaverse where they can control the environment. They'll never get bullied. They'll never get talked down to. They'll never get shamed. They can create any kind of avatar, any look that they want. They can behave and look almost like a superhero if they want to in that environment. And is that going to be attractive for many people to disappear down that rabbit hole of the metaverse and never come out? Absolutely. There's no question about that. But I, I don't see it as too different to people that spend 15 hours or 20 hours a day in social media. It's not that much different. It's an evolution of that. But it's not that much different. And so I think the, the same struggle for balance we already have is going to be the same struggle for balance that's carried over into the metaverse. Well, I, I'd like to contribute to this idea because I'm not trying to turn this into a therapy session, but I had a pretty hard time in school. And in doing so, turned to video games, turned to online communities as a way to feel like I belong somewhere and to be part of a more positive environment. 
And to this day, I still, I still game as a hobby, although, you know, I'm treated very nicely at work. So, you know, so that part at least has diminished us uh, uh, somewhat. The ability to disconnect from, from being on the online world, from some of the most highly addictive video games is within our, our ability of control because there's only so much encoding that happens. Yeah, we're playing World of Warcraft and we're playing it quite a while and it's designed to keep people uh, sticking around and playing and, and, and grinding and, and all of that. But at least it's still taking place on a computer where, you know, all you have to do is like turn around and you're just taken out of the environment like that. Whereas putting on a virtual reality helmet or even going so far as being in a room where they are spraying different senses at you, like they start squirting water at you, which they've done in theaters, by the way. The amount of encoding that would take place when people are having these near one-to-one uh, experiences is, I think, much more prevalent or much more powerful, much more potent. And it's it, it, the risk can be that it will be 10 times as hard to pull people out of that addiction than it has been already. And it already has been rather difficult for a lot of people to to just basically snap out of it. And then on the other side, you look at what is so bad about society that keeps people from wanting to participate in it. And the reality is, yeah, for me, I know this is getting a little uh, political here, but I, I think it's worth bringing up once in a while, is on the one hand, you do have people give you a hard time, you do have bullies, but then you have what it's, what's even worse is trying to stand up to them and trying yes. to fight back. Maybe you gain the respect one out of 10 times. Maybe the teachers will suspend you and or expel you based on how you retaliate. Maybe the bullies start calling their friends and the situation gets worse. So we still have to look into what is making reality so problematic for so many people and use people's ex- eagerness and time spent on these other platforms as a metric to decide why are people spending half their life on these games or in these environments and, and not in this other world that we've worked pretty hard to create so far. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. I think that people around the world are losing faith in government. They're losing faith in in community. They're losing faith in in many things in their life. They're losing faith in religion. They're losing faith in in lots of things. I'm 47 years old. And and what I've learned is that the human connection, the heart, love, emotion, these things, they are the stuff that make us human. And those things are super, super hard to get in a virtual environment, even across Zoom, we have, even with a call like this, where you can see my hands, you can't see all of my body language. You can't, we're energetic beings. We know this. I know it sounds woo woo and I'm not a tree hugger by any stretch. Modern science has proven that we are biomechanical beings and that, and that we're, we have an electrical pulse that pulses through our body that's generated by our heart. And, and so much of our sensory perception is based on these energetic outputs of the human body. And even to the point where we know that, for example, when we hug our friend or we hug our loved one, there's an instant shot of oxytocin that you don't get. Even if I'm talking to the same person via Zoom, I don't get the oxytocin shot, which is actually a moderator for dopamine. So Mm -hmm. oxytocin automatically cancels out dopamine. And so the gaming engines and these virtual reality worlds, they play very heavily on our dopamine system, but they cannot replace oxytocin. And so that that comes from human connection and human touch and human interaction being in the same physical space. And so I, there is at the moment there is no replacement for that. Now, will VR body suits with olfactory sense and haptic capabilities and ultimately where Elon wants to take us with human machine brain interfaces and computer brain interfaces, BCI's brain uh, computer interfaces, will those where we have direct brain stimulation to where our brain won't literally be able to tell the difference between physical and virtual because it's triggering the same neurons that it would if we were physically in person, will we be able to all of a sudden now be able to trigger an oxytocin release by hugging someone 10,000 miles away because we feel like we're actually hugging them? I don't think I have the answers to that, and I don't think anybody does yet. But for the time being, people need to understand the biology of their body and of the immune system. They need to understand these things better without before they rush headlong into the digital. I think they need to understand what the feedback loop they're creating for themselves and their physical body. If they understand, and I come from a, a very strong natural health background. I ran e-commerce uh, you know, for New Zealand's largest online retailer of natural health products. I've been into natural health since I was a kid and, and so were my parents. And so I guess from a supplementation perspective, from a from an exercise perspective, from a, a breath perspective, there's lots of things that are important to me because they've always been important to me and they've always been taught to me as being important to me. Mm-hmm. What I'm more concerned about is people that don't understand how their body works. They don't understand the endocrine system. They don't understand how every single hormone that they have in their body is being hijacked 
by digital technology because that the, the digital technology is trying to achieve an outcome and it understands our biology better than we do in many cases and it can achieve that outcome because they've tested to achieve that outcome. And so all I would encourage people to do is to start understanding the biology of the human body better before rushing headlong into technology with reckless abandon. That's all I would recommend. I think that's fantastic. And I knew, I didn't know, but I predicted that what we talked about right at the beginning, the balance between tech and, and, and living in nature would come up again. And your, your background, working in, in, in natural health space and all of that, it, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. And then I, in, in my mind, I just imagined what would happen if somebody would enter the VR space and almost have a magic school bus experience where they are shrunk down to the, the molecular level and actually can probably can possibly w- learn what you're discussing in a much more intuitive way because they're seeing for themselves what, what our cells are up to, what our atoms are up to, and, and the work that our, our, our bodies are, are, are going through on a day-to-day basis. It's really fascinating stuff. It is. So this is another thing that I chambered earlier. So you had mentioned, you did mention the metaverse. We talked about it. We've been talking about it. But I noticed something has happened a couple of times, in, especially in the digital space. In the gaming space, Valve, the creators of Half-Life, Counter-Strike, they released a, they released a gaming platform known as Steam. And for quite a while, Steam was pretty much the only one in the marketplace. And they had a game that was so in demand that players were forced to adopt Steam in order to play the game. It was Half-Life 2. Everybody wanted to play it. It was like the holy grail of of gaming at the time. And it still holds up. And over time, publishers were putting their games on these platforms. And they said, you know what, never mind. I think we would rather make our own. And now we have 50 different gaming clients from the different companies. Same thing happened with Netflix. Disney, for instance, a lot of these uh, major companies were... They were just jam packing Netflix with so much content. You would be crazy not to have it. Like it was, there was just so much value in there. And then the same thing happened. Everybody saw, saw dollar signs in their eyes and said, yeah, you know what? I think we'll just, we'll do our own thing. So now we have Disney plus you have uh, Netflix, uh, Hulu and all these other ones. I sh- and as a consumer from television, it's not so bad. Cause I could just subscribe for one month, exit, subscribe for another month. It's not so bad. It's manageable. I'm wondering if we're if anything like this is going to happen when we get to the metaverse, where instead of maybe at first, we'll start with one shared experience where everybody will have their own space. But then over time, companies are going to say, you know what, I think we at Google, we want to create our own version of it, or we at Apple want to create our own version of it. This pattern does come up. I personally don't think it's a good pattern. I, I think more people stand to benefit from having more centralized content releases or content release platforms. However, I just uh, want to know, has any of this crossed your mind or, or are we looking more, what's more likely? Are we looking at one singular metaverse that everyone is going to share or are we multiple metaverses? I liken it to tabs in a browser. So as of today, we have browser tabs and we have, I can go to an owned e-commerce website of a brand that I like and I can shop directly with them. I can log into Facebook and I can sometimes see their representation. Maybe they've got a Facebook shop or they've got an Instagram shop. And I can log into Instagram on my phone and I can access their shop within Instagram. I can maybe go to Amazon or Trade Me or eBay and I can see their Amazon store on on Amazon, but they also have their own website. So I think the metaverse will be very similar. I think we'll get to a place where we walk, where we virtually step into this open palleted space where we've got this these tabs of metaverse eye all down the right hand side of the screen for lack of a better term. And we just grab one and all of a sudden now, boom, we're, or we just, or we just tap that. And all of a sudden we're whisked into that particular metaverse, right? Whereas we will be able to create our own metaverses ourselves in these, just like we can create our own websites today on Squarespace, whatever the case may be. And as businesses, many businesses, at least at first will probably be challenged to create their own metaverse. And so therefore today they can create their own website with relative ease but it will be challenging for them to create their own metaverse at first because there's not a lot of standardization. So there's no equivalent of HTML5, uh, JavaScript, and all the web standards of today. All of those standards don't yet exist in the metaverse. They're being developed, but they don't yet exist. And as a result of that, only the biggest, most powerful brands like the Nikes and Adidas of the world and the Walmarts of the world have the capability to create an owned metaverse today with maybe even their own cryptocurrency for loyalty and proof of ownership and all that sort of stuff. That's very expensive today because the technology is so new. But give it five to 10 years, that won't be the case. And you'll have templated metaverses that you can adopt with underlying operating systems that run that. There'll be standardization that will emerge just like there has all the way from the old VHS and beta days and then video discs. And then we move to, to, to CDs and DVDs. And then we move to streaming, over-the-air streaming. So there will be standards that will emerge. And no doubt, 
Facebook and, and Google and Apple, they will be trying hard to create metaverses of their own that all the major brands want to be represented in digitally. And they'll have digital assets that can be bought and sold in that place. And also physical goods that can be bought and sold via that metaverse. So I don't see it as much different as a brand today saying, okay, what are the channel? what is the channel mix that I want to be in? I want to have my own website. I want to sell on Amazon. I want to sell via social. I want to sell through these different digital channels. I see the metaverse evolving in a, in a very similar way. I see some brands will develop their own website or their own metaverse. And then sometimes we have a lot of brands today that are what's called Amazon native brands. So they started on Amazon and Amazon is the only channel that they sell on. There will be some brands in the future that start out and grow up in, say, for example, the Facebook metaverse, and, and they don't go anywhere else. That is their own channel. And that is the only channel that they transact in. That is the only channel that they build an audience in. That is the only channel that they build a community. And that's fine. Facebook is going to create an environment where that is entirely possible. And I suspect that so will Amazon. I suspect so will Google. I suspect so will Apple. I suspect that all these major tech players will create metaverse that brands want to be present in, whether that be exclusively or as part of their overall channel mix. And I think as users of these various different metaverses, we will be able to pick and choose which ones we go into. Now, there's going to be a level of interoperability that comes along with this, i.e. NFT avatars, for example. And there will become a standard that emerges there that I can take my avatar that I own and I can bring that into whatever metaverse environment that I'm in. And so that's how I see it. I see it as browser tabs with different experiences in those browser tabs. Some are owned, some are rented, some are earned. And I see that exact same plethora of environments emerging in the metaverse world. One of the things that I, I also want to get your take on too is one of the main criticisms that I see of a uh, cryptocurrency and of NFTs. And I should say, I am excited and you know enthusiastic about both of these. I, I own some cryptocurrency and I'm working on some NFT stuff. I, I have my own like personal philosophy on it, at least you know for the time being, which is I that these things are passive. So for instance, when I do a little bit of audio editing on my own, and whenever I see an audio signature that I think is interesting, I I, I, take, I could take that and turn that into an NFT and just put it on an open sea and see what happens. I'm not like, I'm just doing it anyways. An extra five seconds worth of effort, you never know where it's going to go. And then with cryptocurrency, I'm using Brave Generates BAT. So once a year, everything heads into uphold and then I just convert it into Bitcoin and hold on to it. So it, yeah. I don't have to go out of my way for anything. So that's just so you know, I, I'm really enthusiastic about this stuff. But again, one of those main criticisms that I've seen is actually the environmental impact on this. Now, somebody who has quite, I would say like a higher degree of you know, environmental experience and like the average person, is this valid? The impact of it? Is it a burden now, but it will pay off later as they're able to replace or become alternatives to what currently may be more environmentally or resource intensive methods of payment? Yeah, look, I think that's why cryptocurrencies and blockchains like Solana, like Polkadot, that, that's why we have these new layer one blockchains that are very efficient. And if you look at Solana, where the gas fees are sent per smart contract or a cent per NFT, because, the, the, because they don't use proof of work as the consensus mechanism, they don't, use the, they don't use proof of work like Bitcoin to create or mine the coins or the tokens. And as a result of that, they have different consensus mechanisms. They have different minting mechanisms. They have different mining mechanisms that are so vastly more efficient than what we've seen, even with Ethereum 1. Now, Ethereum 2 is supposed to move away from its super ultra high gas fees, and it's going to move to a much more Solana proof of history a consensus environment. And as a result of that, I see everybody in the industry knows that it is not sustainable. If only Bitcoin existed still to this day, and of course, Bitcoin doesn't even support smart contracts. It doesn't support NFTs. It's a legacy crypto. You can think of it as e-gold more than an e-silver. I think of the other layer one, layer one cryptos as more e-silver, i.e. they have a very utilitarian purpose behind them and they have a very utilitarian use behind them. And that's what gives the network value as opposed to pure proof. And so I, I, I see a future evolving very rapidly where the old school layer one blockchains of the past are simply no longer accepted and used by the community. Mm -hmm. Applications are no longer built out on them and we just lose them by attrition or they adapt. Either they adapt. And so, for example, Bitcoin could change away from a proof of work model to something else that wasn't as as energy intensive. Will they do that? Probably not because the Bitcoin is not known as being very progressive, 
But a lot of the other layer one blockchains are very progressive. And I see a world emerging within the next, say, five years where gas fees drop to basically zero because the energy required to mine those tokens is basically zero. And to mint an NFT is basically zero, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really see this as a, a major issue that most of the players in the space grasp very intuitively. And they don't want the old school ways to carry on into the future. They just don't, they don't want that. Because remember, the high cost is also a barrier to adoption. So even if they're not in favor of protecting the environment or reduce, reducing environmental impact, they are in favor of reducing the cost and the complexity because that will dramatically increase adoption, therefore increase the size of the total addressable market. So um, one point that I want to bring up because of the way you related Bitcoin to gold, I'm not like, well, actually, yeah, I have seen gold. Like I've always uh, appreciated it. And the main reason why I appreciate it is it does have utility. Like it is used in computers. It is used as a superconductor. They paint it on the sides of spaceships. So I think that is one of the reasons why gold has continued to be of value. And it, it's curious to, because it has that about two sides to it. It has the aesthetic side to it because gold also doesn't rust. But then it also has... I, it's an immense and future-facing uh, potential for it. So to support your argument, I think the way I see Bitcoin is it's more of an antique at this point. It's like finding like an original Model T or finding yeah. like one of the very first muskets that ever came out. Credit to Tara Warwick for coming up with that one. And so owning it is owning a piece of history and, and, and a piece of the legacy of it. And then the remaining, all these other ones that are in the market right now are looking to molt, right? Shed their skin, transform, and become a, a better version of it. For people who are holding on to all, all these different coins is are, are people going to, I know this is like a few, a few rungs uh, off track, but I encourage that kind of thing anyways. I, is it possible that people can be holding on to various crypto coins that are just not going to have any value or will they enter antiquity or do they need to be converted into something else? How do you keep track of like which coins are worth holding on to? For me, like I'm, I'm still relatively new to this I, as I think a lot of people are. And yeah, yeah look, yeah, we're trying definitely. to change the wheels on the car while it's going down the motorway at 100 kilometers an hour. So I don't think anyone that tells you they can predict exactly what's going to happen in the future, I think is either lying or delusional. But I think that there are very clear emerging blockchains with underlying tokens that have both current and roadmap and utility associated with them that give the underlying crypto its value. So I, I'm not looking at them as a pure store of value. What gives them value is the network capability of those blockchains. And if we look at Solana and we look at, at its throughput capability in terms of transactions per minute, if we look at its native capability around smart contracts and what it can do in that area and, and the types of applications, the types of Web3 and DeFi applications or dApps that can be built out on Solana today, and what they have on their roadmap is insane. And when we look at that utility, because all of the apps, for example, that are built on the Solana blockchain will use, for transactional purposes, will use the sole cryptocurrency as the underlying currency for all transactions on the blockchain, that's what gives that particular cryptocurrency its value. It's not like a Bitcoin where it's the scarcity aspect of it that necessarily gives it its value or the difficulty of mining it that gives it its value. Mm -hmm. In the case of Solana and some of the other blockchains, it's their sheer utility in the Web3 world that gives them their value. And because they are constraining the amount of coins that can be in circulation at any given point in time, that's what controls the inflation rate of the value of those underlying tokens. And so for me, I'm always trying to look at what is the utility of those blockchains. And so I guess because I've been in the tech space for a long time, I grasp those utilities pretty quickly when I start to read their tech specs, what they can do, when I start reading some of the commentary from people that are much smarter than me around crypto algorithms and describing what those algorithms are capable of in layman's terms, I can pick those up really quickly and I can go, there's probably only maybe three, maybe four layer one modern what I would call Gen 3 layer one blockchains that I think have such utility value that I can almost guarantee they will continue to grow in popularity and they will continue to grow in use. And they have different levels of utility. If we compare Polkadot, for example, with Solana, 
polka dot and its ability to create parachains, which is chain on chain technology, Solana doesn't have that. And so when we look at Polkadot, it doesn't maybe have the transaction per minute capability of a Solana. It maybe doesn't have the flexibility of its smart contracts that perhaps a Solana does. There's some other things that, that Solana does better than Polkadot, but then there's things that Polkadot does far better, or there's functionality that it has that literally no other blockchain has today. And others may copy them, but for as of today, there's certain things it can do that no one else can. And so when I look at the utility or the technical capabilities of these specific blockchains, and what that contributes to their token value, that to me is the most interesting part. Holding cryptocurrency for the sake of holding cryptocurrency doesn't really interest me, mm -hmm. but I'm a bullish on Solana. I'm bullish on Polkadot. I'm bullish on these cryptocurrencies because of what the blockchain sitting on top of them can I know I'm not the first person to say this to you. I'm definitely going to have to go back and listen to this again, re reabsorb this information. Credit, credit it's true. You, re you really do know your stuff. I'm, I'm impressed, uh, to, to say the least. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears because there's something else that I wanted to make sure that we talked about before we run out of time, which is you do have a hand in, in the retail space. And we don't get to talk to too many people in the retail space. In fact, I remember the last... No, I actually had to talk to two people in the retail space, although one of them preferred not to call it retail. He preferred to call it showroom. So suffice it to say, we don't get to talk about it too often. I'll start with the, with the you know, the 30,000 foot overview of it. But what role are you playing right now in the retail space with the clients that you're working with, helping them? Are you, you mentioned earlier, a lot of the clients that you're working with, they're maybe reluctant to, maybe too reluctant to uh, adopt some of this um, uh, digital technology. So I'm also wondering if there's like an uh, opposite of this, where people who are like heavily in the digital space, they have an advantage waiting for them in the physical space that they're not taking. I'm wondering if that's come up. Yeah, there's both of those scenarios playing out. And because I focus on really complex uh, commerce environments, I don't deal with too many vanilla retailers that, for example, are just selling the same stuff as 20 other retailers. Most of the time, I'm dealing with very strong brands that either are manufacturing products or they are a wholesaler distributor of those products in a given region. And so therefore, they have some element of curation capability of the products that they sell, and they have some element of pricing power uh, over those products in the market as opposed to just a sheer race to the bottom. So for those brands, what they're trying to figure out in most cases is, where is the biggest growth opportunity for my brand? Is it is do I go and spend a whole bunch more money on physical stores? Because as we start to come out of lockdowns, we're seeing a lot of physical stores starting to do very well again as people are going, man, I'm so sick of being locked down. I want to get out there and I want to go to the mall. I want to go to my physical stores. I want to go and sit on physical furniture before I buy it again instead of just seeing it as an AR overlay in my house. So we're seeing physical retail rebound very strongly as places come out of lockdown globally. And I think that's been a global phenomenon. But I think that some of the gains that we've achieved Say, for example, a 10% on average increase in uh, e-commerce adoption as a total percentage of retail is becoming the common sort of average around the world. In the case of New Zealand, for example, or Australia, that's 10 years worth of e-commerce penetration that happened in a year or two. So we, we definitely have seen an acceleration. So to, to walk back entirely from committing to digital and committing to e-commerce would be suicide, I think, for brands that, that maybe started that transition or started that enhancement during COVID. I think it would be foolish for them to all of a sudden start to cut investment in those areas because they will only continue to grow, maybe not at the same rate that they did during COVID because people had no choice. They had to shop from home. But I think that the brands, they're trying to figure out what is the ideal channel mix for us. Because we can't invest in everything. We can't go and build a, build 50 extra stores. We can't go and invest a um, million dollars in our digital channels tomorrow. We can't make all these investments. And, and even if we had the money, we don't have the capability. We don't have the internal resources and capability to focus on all these things because then we'll do none of them really well. And so we want to we wanna focus and we want to do some exceptionally well. And so that's where a lot of these brands are starting to bring in consultants such as myself, or they're starting to work more closely with their agency, their development agency, for example. They're starting to lean on those external resources for perhaps short sprints, short projects, short programs of work where I come in and like my average engagement with my clients is say perhaps six months. And I help them go through a pretty significant period of digital transformation over that six months. And then I hand it back to them and they run with it. Or they maybe retain me for a period after that to hold, ask questions of, keep them on the straight and narrow, bounce ideas off of, et cetera, and, and help hold their hand in the medium to long term. But I help them with organizational change so that I can help them identify 
the capability gaps within the business so that they can slowly start to fill those over time so that they have less reliance on me or anyone else. And they can start to build up some of that internal capability through knowledge, uh, effective knowledge transfer of those external a- uh, experts, bringing that capability internal to them. And, and then they can start making these decisions on their own internally ba- based on, because no matter how much they open their kimono to me, it's not quite the same as being a full-blown employee in the business. People mm-hmm. that are in the business and focus solely on that business 24 seven, they're gonna be much more embedded in that business than I will ever be. But sometimes they need help bridging that gap to get from where they are to where they wanna be, or even figuring out where they are and where they want to get to. That's sometimes the biggest challenge that they have. And so those brands that I'm working with, I'm helping them figure out what their channel mix is. I'm helping them figure out what their tech stack needs to be, helping them figure out their organizational design, their process design. How can we take some of these really legacy processes that you've had in your business, how through the use of technology and some of the inerrant uh, inerrant processes that come along with that technology, how can we improve what you do today and how can we make that lots more efficient? So lots of discussions we're having, but most retailers are just really struggling with what is the the perfect channel mix. And I don't think, I think there's perfect for now, but I don't think that will always be perfect because we have so many channels that are evolving and emerging every single day that I think the idea for me is how can we build a stack? How can we build an organizational design? How can we build process design in such a way that it makes you infinitely scalable and infinitely flexible because that's what businesses need more than being locked in the current way or moving to a new locked in way of doing things. We need to build flexibility and scalability into the beating heart of the business Mm -hmm. to where this increasing rate of change doesn't break the back of your business. One of the mistakes that I remember you talking about on uh, on someone else's podcast was that a lot of these businesses, they go so far as to develop their own technology from the ground up. Like they come up with, they, they bring in programmers, they come up with their, their own software, their own POS. And it, it within the span of six months, it ends up slowing the, the, the business down because every time they need to update it, they got to bring those people back in. And then it's just, I remember this happens. I, you know, I used to work in, in the retail battlefield and we remember our, our, yes, it stands for a point of service, but POS can stand for something else, if you know what I mean. And so I think this ties into what you described with tech stack. And again, this is one of those terms that doesn't come up very often in our program. How do you, how are you explaining to, to brands exactly what the tech stack is and, and what it is that they need to to, to you to do to integrate it properly? Yeah, so we always start with looking at where they are today, independent of the tech. Where are you today in your business and how you run your business? And where would you like to be? Where are those pain points in your business today that you think, man, we're really not efficient here, or staff morale in this department is really bad because of X, Y, Z, or we're not able to attract top talent because of X, Y, Z. Or we're not able to meet our sales targets based on talking to our salespeople because of X, Y, Z. Or we're hemorrhaging. We have too much churn of our customers because of X, Y, Z. So there's usually some real strong pain points when you get into discovery with them. And I try to leave the tech out of the discussion in those very early phases. And I start to look at two things. I look at what understanding the business has already internally of where their pain points are and what they think is holding them back. And then I also look at their data. So I say, show me your customer data. I say, show me what that looks like. What is the depth and breadth of the customer data that you have today? And and do you think you have gaps in that? And what do those gaps look like? And then show me your product data. Again, what does the product data structure look like? Do you have structured and unstructured data around your products? Is it digital ready? Is it digital channel ready? Is it not? What does your pricing model look like, both for B2C and B2B? What do your customer groups look like? How do you service them? What differentiates them? What kind of logistics? How how does your logistics work and how does that affect pricing? All these different things, we start to look at it independent of the tech because tech is just a tool that can help us fix problems or make us more efficient or make us more happy and, and enjoy our work more and attract better talent because we're working with better tech perhaps that allows them to do their job better. And so I try to always start independent of the tech and then I start to match up some of the tech that I think can start to plug some of these gaps and, and make them more efficient and happier and enjoy work more and enjoy business more and helping their customers enjoy interfacing with them more from a customer experience perspective. It, it's my job to understand the tech, not theirs. 
And so then I can open a dialogue about tech with them and say, we could look at these two, maybe two or three pieces of technology that would plug these gaps. And if we allow them through integration to share data with each other, this is going to dramatically improve X, Y, Z in the business and with the customer experience. And so for me, because most of the time, if I start talking tech too early, it goes straight over their head anyway. And so it's always about what is the tech in context for their business? And I only work with SaaS platforms, so I don't work with any legacy tech. I don't work with any on-prem or past platforms. I work with all SaaS because the world is now API-driven. It's API-led. It's integration-led. Uh, in many cases, it's moving to, to headless for a lot of brands and microservices-driven. And on-premise platforms just don't lend themselves well to this new platform as a service or, or a software as a service environment. It just doesn't lend itself well to infinite scaling and infinite flexibility, whereas SaaS generally does. So I'm looking at it through the SaaS lens and I'm helping businesses to understand the benefits of SaaSification across their entire business. And sometimes they're on board with that. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they've got some legacy tech that needs to stay in place for complexity or ROI reasons that maybe they just invested in it a year ago and they're not going to rip it out tomorrow. So we have to work. We, I, I have to meet clients where they are, but also provide them a realistic roadmap map to get where they want to be. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I was thinking, and 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 you said it out loud when they've only just got this the software going, and they don't want to just gut it out right away. So it seems that there has to be that sweet spot where if you can say yes, if you you know you integrate this uh, the SaaS, this will help you grow to this point. But until that, you might end up having to stick with what you have for now, just until then they get into this balance of what if this is preventing their growth. But yeah, I, I I don't profess to be able to keep up with you and what and what entails with this, but it is an interesting uh, balancing act between being able to help them identify their needs and figure out what it is that's holding them back. Yep, absolutely. I guess it's for me, it's really just how can we look at the future state and try to paint the picture of a future state and create the bridge that there's five, 10 steps that need to get us from the current state to the future state. And it doesn't mean we're all going to, we're going to do them all in the first two months, three months, six months, 12 months. Maybe it's an 18 month roadmap. Maybe it's a 24 month roadmap. Maybe it's a 36 month roadmap. I'm not a big fan. I used to be a big fan at early in my career of boiling the ocean or big bang projects that were totally transformative in their own. But I find that oftentimes if you try to I'm a big fan of eating the elephant one bite at a time. And instead of going in and saying, hey, we're going to replatform ERP, CRM, e-com, and point of sale all in one big bang project, that is very difficult to do. And it's very disruptive to a business. I've, I've been part of programs of work like that before, and it is it can turn into a very rapid nightmare. And so trying to roadmap that, sure, there's some pieces that you have to do as a chunk, maybe it's ERP and CRM, for example, and you just can't separate those because they're so operationally focused and so financially focused. And so maybe you do those together, but you don't necessarily go in and do ERP, e-com, PIM, CDP, and pause all at the same time because you just you have such a high risk of failure of getting project fatigue and overrunning budgets and overrunning timelines, and you never get anything live in the end. I'd rather break that down into digestible pieces from a financial perspective and from a transformation perspective. I, this this hour has been flying by. I do periodically just look at the clock just to see how, how we're doing. And- Goodness gracious. So the, the last question that I that I want to ask you before we start uh, wrapping this up, I want to get back to, to retail. And so first, just so I know that I'm like visualizing this correctly. So you said that you don't work with uh, vanilla retail. And when I hear that, I'm imagining stuff like Walmart, places that they're just, they're more like wholesalers. So they are collecting the product, then they're selling it. They don't, Walmart, to my knowledge, doesn't manufacture it. Whereas- Or maybe yeah. they have a house brand, but it's 5% of the products. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And for all we know, they just import products from somebody else, relabel it anyways. So, whereas, so I mean, are some of the brands that you may work with, is it possible that you know you will be able to see them if you pay a visit to a mall? I just, this is like- No, I don't work with any mall brands currently or any like retail chains currently. I'm working primarily with B2B businesses. I work with a couple of large retail brands but they have their own stores independent of the malls. One's a one of the, one's a furniture retail furniture and homewares retailer for example and they've got stores right throughout the whole of New Zealand, physical retail stores as well as online. And funnily enough, I work with I work with a waste company in Ireland for example and create they have basically turned their services into products. They productize their services and they sell them online as services to people who need weight, different types of waste disposed of. I work with a fabric importer and wholesaler. I, you know, I work with, I, yeah. So I don't work with any like mall brands, but I work with brands that oftentimes they'll have a wholesale, a D2C component of their business. That's really common for the brands that I'm working with, or they're looking at introducing 
direct to consumer as an additional channel in addition to their B2B and wholesale uh, sales that they do today. And so that's why people say, often say to me, B2B and D2C, direct to consumer are so different. How do you, like, why would you pick those two to work together? Actually, B2B and D2C have a lot of correlation because so many B2B brands do want to establish a D2C channel. And so they are tightly aligned in many cases. Yeah, and I could, it's a bit, I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. There, There is an argument that all B2B is still just within the parameters of D2C because it's one business onto another business who in that context are customers anyway. So that's it's semantical, but I, it's, still, it's still an observation. And the reason why I wanted to qualify that is just because I'm still really interested in asking you this question just about the retail experience with your with what your understanding of, of Web3 and the metaverse I mean, and what we've talked about so far in, in the retail space now that there's a lot of momentum in the retail space is what are you seeing that retail stores are going to be able to do to really make it worth their while to, to stay in business? And one thing that I want to add to this, just to you know, help with the understanding of it is there are a lot of things that you can just do to you can just buy a lot of things online. The, today was the first time that I realized why my girlfriend and I like going to malls. It's a low risk amusement park. Like yes. There's there's sights, there's scents, there's sensations, and once in a while you, there's there may be a ride, but not really. It's mostly just walking around and, and experiencing all of these things. There's kiosks, there's popcorn for God's sakes. With the emergence of what is the metaverse, what are you seeing retail stores or just brands in general, even ones who have their own offsite off mall stores like the ones that you just des- described, the, the furniture retailer? What are they doing to prep for being worth having? What are they doing to make it worth having physical space? The vast, vast majority are not. That's that's the honest truth. And retail is pretty shitty the world over. There's very few brands that create what I would call experiential retail. We've got a brand down here, a retail brand called Culture Kings that does it pretty well. They've got an in-store DJ. They have influencers come in store for autograph signings. They have they have food experiences. They have the retail or coming in and buying say the latest skate shirt. So they're a streetwear and, and skate and culture, cultural, cultural type clothing, fashion brand, right? Retailer. They don't make their own brand. So they sell like the Quicksilvers of the world and other streetwear brands. But they they have done a pretty good job of trying to create massive draw cards to come to their store, whether or not you buy any piece of fashion in store, for example, you, they're trying to create a hundred reasons to go into a culture King store, even if you never buy, or if you only ever buy clothes online from them or fashion online or shoes online with them, they're trying to create 101 reasons for you to come to their store anyway, mm-hmm. just to be, just to experience their brand. And I think that this is going to become the norm. I think that uh, Amazon has just announced their new style store that they're going to be building in LA, which is going to be a completely experiential store where it's going to be completely integrated with their mobile app. You'll be able to request things in your size to be able to send, uh, be able to be seen by people in the store. You won't even see them. They'll grab your right size and they'll take it to your fitting room. They'll have integration with smart mirrors. They're going to have integration with beacons. They're going to, there's going to be some pretty cool stuff that they're going to be bringing because of their digital prowess and because of their go store technology. And they're going to be They're basically going to be leaning into their strengths as a digital first business to bring all sorts of digital overlays or digital enhancements to the physical experience in the store. Now, and in terms of product recommendations and the whole nine yards, right? Now, will they be able to pull that off? Because it's it's probably easier for them to do that in a digital space than a physical space. They've seemed to have been able to figure out just walk out technology, and that was bloody hard to crack. So do I think that their Gen 1 product will be amazing and their Gen 1 physical experience of their department store? Do I think it'll be amazing? Probably not, but they'll learn fast and they will improve fast as they do with everything else that they do. And I think they're going to set the standard pretty quickly of what a digitalized physical experience looks like. And I have lots of ideas where this could go. I've thought about this for many years and I've thought about all the friction that is introduced in the physical shopping experience. There's a thousand points of friction that currently lives in the physical space. And if we just removed half, the physical experience would be so much better. And I'm watching businesses like Amazon. There's a few that do it. There's a furniture brand called Brosa today that have swing tags with QR codes on their products in store where you can just scan it, will automatically pull it up in the app. And it will show you all the specs of the product, the information. It will show you stock availability by store. They And, and you can book, book time with a consultant. And there's other things that you can do that help to bridge that physical to virtual experience where you can carry over what you've been looking at in store online and vice versa. So brands are starting to lean that direction, but many of them 
just it's just not a priority yet and they don't mm-hmm. know what's possible yet or they don't even know what they want to build yet in terms of that experience. And so brands need to start thinking about that today. But there's what's called DXPs, digital experience platforms that can help. There's one down here that's an Australian technology platform called platform called Omni, Omnio. And they're creating, they're creating technology that automatically bridges the physical and, and virtual to where both loyal as well as your purchase history and everything, it's all synced automatically through the app that benefits the customer. Not It primarily benefits the customer experience, not necessarily the brand. And these types of technologies are going to make that a lot easier moving forward once they become standardized. One one passing thought that uh, crossed my mind as well is not to get too political, I'm getting a little political, but not too political, is a, a lot of the pressure that people put on uh, larger companies to you know, increase their, their taxes and to you know contribute more money back into the Fed. And yet there's another form of pressure here, which is the bigger the company, the more pressure they have to adopt emerging technology, take the risk on it, potentially lose millions of pod, uh, tens of millions of dollars on it. And if, they, and if they don't, they're either left in the dust or they're perceived as uh, archaic all of a sudden by not being on top of everything that, that's coming. So it, it is fascinating to see how technology actually puts pressure on larger companies to have to continue to reinvest their money back into the economy. Yes. Yeah, I, I, there's no question about that. You look at what Nike's doing in the metaverse and or what they're planning to do, and they've got no choice. They have to protect their brand in these virtual spaces. They, don't, they literally do not have a choice, even if they hated the metaverse, which I suspect that they don't. They literally have to invest tens of millions, which will ultimately be hundreds of millions of dollars in the digital space. Because if they don't, then they they won't be protecting their brand in these emerging channels. And so they just, they literally don't have a choice. If you're a smaller business that doesn't have a brand, obviously with the strength of a Nike, then maybe you can be a fast follower. You don't have to be a leader. You don't want to be a laggard either, but you don't have to be a, a leader, right? You you can be a fast follower. You can watch what the biggest brands are doing. You can let them make a lot of the mistakes first. You can emulate what they're doing, but tweak it and modify it and mold it to your business and your brand and your customer experience, but let them make the mistakes first and just mm-hmm. look at what they're doing and follow it very closely and say, we're going to be a fast follower. We're not going to be a leader. Yeah, because you just imagine not having, for that brand to not have any of their own impact in the metaverse. There's no telling what experience somebody might have related to Nike. It's like, oh yeah, I just walked to this other store to pick up the Nike shoes and I got attacked by eight Sasquatches because you know, who knows what's going to happen at first. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Well, Jason, this has been just like a j- hour jam packed with uh, with interesting insights. I'm My mind is just like uh, swimming around. with, not, uh, and, and I will say I'm a little more optimistic about where we're going with this than I was prior to the conversation. So for that, I think. That makes me feel pretty good then. Yeah, it's the truth. It's coming one way or another, right? So let's, like you say, let's look for how, how to integrate this into our lifestyle, in, into business, and in a way that uh, actually teaches people the value of, of, of humanity and still connecting with one another until Neuralink takes off and then we can get our oxytocin hit from like miles away. That'll be well. All right, Jason, a final question to wrap this up. A, if you have, there's a, a Chinese proverb or a quote or a saying that's been sticking in your mind lately, feel free to share it and then let the audience know how they can make contact with you. Yeah, I think the one that, that I'm trying to live, I've heard this saying before and I've tried to integrate it into my life, but I'm really, truly trying to integrate it into my life, particularly with lockdowns and the way our government's handling COVID and everything else. If you see the world as life happening for you instead of to you, that one mindset change. So if, if something happens, oh, this happened to me. No, it didn't. It happened for you. I just have to figure out. I just have to figure out how and why. So mm-hmm. that one mindset change alone, I forget where I heard that. I think it may have been Tony Robbins or something like that. But I, I think if we can change our mindset to instead of things happening to us, things are happening for us. We just have to figure out why or how and figure out how to apply that learning in our life that will help us to become more positive just generally. And I think mindset and heart set are the two things we have control over. We have to guard what we allow into our sphere, whether that be friendships, whether that be media, doesn't matter what we're talking about. We have to jealously guard what we allow into our heart space and our head space because we ha- we actually do have control over that. And that's those are the things we actually have control over. We can't control what happens external to us, but we can handle, uh, we can control what happens inside our, our brain and our heart and our, our mindset. So I think that to me is a biggie. Sorry, what was the second? Actually, I'm glad you asked because I just wanted to I echo your sentiment there. I've had it in a similar way, not exactly the way you're, you're saying puts it, but 
the way my mindset was, is if this experience that I'm having, this lived experience that I'm having is something that I planned for myself, then everything that happens to me is an opportunity for me to say, so why would I do that to myself? Why am I giving myself this challenge? Why did I make myself be frustrated by enthused by that? It, it manifests in different ways, but that's, yeah, that's me uh, echoing your sentiment. The other side of it, the other question was I'd let the audience know how they can make contact and, and check out your podcast too, which I think I'm going to want to do as well, frankly. Oh. Thank you. Best place to, to connect with me is probably LinkedIn. I put out more content there than anywhere and than any of my other channels. I do have my podcast as well, which is at the coalface. Uh, you can find it on literally any podcast engine. I've got my own premium newsletter called at the coalface digest, but I'm also on TikTok. I'm also on Instagram. I'm also, I'm pretty much at YouTube. I'm pretty much everywhere. But basically if you connect with me on LinkedIn and you listen to the podcast, you, you, and I, of course I've got greenwoodconsulting.net, your people probably won't necessarily be interested in engaging me with me for consulting, but I, hopefully they would find something. Super it's actually, useful. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I can go either way. Yeah, yeah but, but hopefully they'd find something super useful out of my content. So basically LinkedIn and podcasts are probably the two quickest, easiest, fastest ways to find me. Okay, excellent. Jason, one more thank you for the road. It's been it's great to have you here. Definitely learned a lot today and I'm looking forward to what I'm going to learn uh, tomorrow and the day after that. And, thank you uh, so much for having me and the, the awesome questions. This has been probably one of the most interesting podcast podcasts that I've been on from a guest perspective and had some super intriguing questions that went pretty deep on stuff that I haven't really talked about before. So well done. That, that means a lot to me. You might find this interesting, but I don't, I have 21 questions that I wrote down. I don't think I asked any of them. That means a good I was part. just like, I was just like taking notes and be like, I'll just like yeah, keep on track with this. Actually, it's funny too, because like my SEO team, they give, they give me some questions now that they want me to ask because it's good for a, a, a SEO. But what are the challenges in implementing omni-channel experiences and solutions? I don't, you don't even have to answer them. I can just ask these and it shows up on the SEO. What businesses should consider op for opening a new marketing channel? How can businesses utilize structured data to improve customer experience? I, I shouldn't mock them like this because I wasn't paying attention to what we were saying. Oh, you know what? We've been bringing up all of this stuff anyway. They're just like, oh, just ask it naturally. Use your voice. I'm like, no, I'm giving you guys all the credit for this. Anyways, yeah, it's uh, your feedback means a lot to me. And, I, and that's everything that I can invoke from my brain. So I'm going to leave it there. To my audience, it is an honor and a privilege to collect this information, use it for my own benefit. You better believe I do. And of course, for all of you as well. So if you want to reach out, you all know what to do. Podcast at dbdefy.com. And with that, take care. We will check in soon. 70s right now, sunny. Um, it was in, in the 20s. Hey, this is Joseph from Ecomonics. Just wanted to thank you for being here and for giving this content your time and attention. I hope you learned something. I can say with certainty, I have learned something with every episode that I have done, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There's a couple of things you can do to help us out. If you want to check out the audio content, we are available on all major podcast platform distributors. And while you're there, give us a five-star review. It helps a lot. And while you're here on YouTube, there's a lot of things you can do to help out as well. It's not going to take very long. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button for this episode, and hit the notification bell. So when we have new content for you, it's going to be at your doorstep ASAP. Lastly, this podcast is created by Debutify, the best Shopify template available. It is 100% free for you to start, and it can change your life. It can make you so much more free than you are right now. So if this episode wasn't enough to convince you, I think a few more might do the trick. So have at it. Thanks for listening to the At The Coalface podcast. If you want more At The Coalface, you can subscribe to our premium e-commerce and digital newsletter, At The Coalface Digest.